Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're seven games into the season, and the Flames are off to the best start they've ever had and won their first seven-game series. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to recap a fairly uh, quiet week for the Flames. Yeah, it was only two games for the Flames this week, and uh, the first one went a lot better than the second one. And yeah, a split in the week isn't bad. On uh, the October 25th, the Calgary Flames were here at the Dome taking on the Pittsburgh Penguins. And this was a, I was at this game. Um, my mom only gets to go to one game every couple of years, and I managed to take her to this game, which was a lot of fun for her. I think she was more interested in the Salad Dome snacks than the game. But uh, Flames ended up winning big 4-1 to one win over the Penguins. We got Jonathan Huberto's first goals of Flame. And, you know, Matt, I'll give my analysis on this first. The Flames came out really well in the first. I thought for... The Calgary Flames, they were able to go out, they were able to set the pace, they were able to establish the way they wanted to play this. In the second, I thought the Penguins started to come back a little bit, and you know there was, I think, 20 shots in that second period alone, but the Flames still managed to stay on top of things. I mean, we got the the Huberto goal and the Stone goal, so they were still able to power through it, and then I thought the third period was really just managing a lead. Yeah, the team really, uh, like over the last few games last week, struggled at times in the first period, uh, both with uh, Markstrom giving up questionable goals and the team just overall being a little on the flat side. Um, Thankfully, in those games, mostly they were able to bounce back and win, but uh, this was the first time that they really came out and shut the door on a, a team in the first period. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that first period was not close. I would say the Flames were probably in the offensive zone, I don't know, 80% of that period. Yeah, I agree. And similar story in the third period when uh, the Flames had that lead, they just basically burned the clock and, you know, kept forcing Pittsburgh to defend. And it was very good uh, time management by the Flames just not to allow anything... Uh, that was really dangerous to occur for the Penguins. Well, I think that's important too, the not dangerous. I mean, when I'm looking back at some notes I have from this game, I think in the first period, the Flames, even though you know Pittsburgh got some offensive chances and got in the zone, the Flames did a really good job of keeping Sp- Pittsburgh away from the net. And they kept them against the boards. They didn't let them get in front. They did a good job of really you know, winning the battles in their own end. And I don't know how many times there was like a Pittsburgh pass that we would intercept because we were digging for it and then go back the other way. Yeah, and it was just a testament to excellent defense that the team has been deploying for most of each game uh, through the first seven. You know, I think one stat here that I know I've harped on in the past is uh, face-offs. And Calgary won 64% of the face-offs here. And you and I have talked about a lot in the past. If you can win those face-offs, especially those offensive zone face-offs, you've got that extra second or two of possession, which can often make the difference. Yeah, and any time that you're controlling the play, it helps, period. And... If you can take the 50-50 decision more often than the 50-50, it just makes the other team have to work that much harder. And the more, the better. And Calgary started off a lot of plays excellently. And it just, anytime you can make the opposition work to overcome what you're doing, you're, you're putting your best foot forward. I guess the only downside for the Flames in this game, I would say, is that Kadri got two but didn't get the third goal. True, but... Uh, You'd like to see him get the hat trick. Uh, of course. It's one of those where i I am been really pleased by how he's started the season with the Flames, and it's good to see him scoring and making plays out of nothing, frankly, a lot of times, and generating good quality scoring chances both for himself and his line mates. And in this game, top Calgary sniper Michael Stone scored. And in the next game against the Edmonton Oilers, top sniper Brett Ritchie scored as the Calgary Flames didn't do as well against the Edmonton Oilers, losing 3-2. to two. They got the early lead and couldn't hold it uh, as the Flames dropped the Hockey Night in Canada tilt. What were your thoughts on this one? Um, this reminded me of so much of the playoff games. Uh, it, it was just 
lack of mental focus by the Flames. Like, they outshot the, the Oilers 43-25. to 25. They really should have, you know, by all metrics, won that game. And it was just a, a sloppy play by uh, Jacob Markstrom allowing the tying goal. And then basically the Flames running around like their hair was on fire for the next few minutes until the Oilers scored again. And by that time, it was too late. And this team needs to learn that the Oilers are not the boogeyman. That, you know, like, they're not a very good team. And, like, they're if you allow them to, they will burn you. But it's all just mental mistakes by the Flames. Like, the Hannafin uh, redirecting it into the net in the first goal... It's one of those where that was unfortunate, but if he was better positioned, perhaps he doesn't need to block the shot in that manner. Or the pass, I should say. Um, Markstrom not recognizing that McDavid's on the ice and that it's better to just let that puck go and be focused on McDavid as a shooter. Um, or It seems stop like the, the puck. Oilers are in the Flames' head, doesn't it? Yeah. like it, 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 None of the goals like were... You're stereotypical, you're generating a lot of scoring chances, and you score. It was like the Flames, like on the last goal by Hyman, um, if the Flames' three defenders that were around Hyman actually took a better placement defensively, or, you know, just shoved the guy over, or, you know, insert a whole bunch of different (laughs) ways of approaching that, uh, like that goal doesn't happen, but you know you can't l- have three guys basically in effect covering one and allow the one guy to beat everybody and score. It's just general sloppiness overall. And it, I like honestly, I don't think that like if say we were playing the Anaheim Ducks, you know, or you know, insert miscellaneous team here, that they would have run around after the McDavid goal to the extent that they did. And it's almost like they were willing the Oilers to win uh, just because, oh, well, you know, after the playoffs, you just know it's coming. And it, it's just weird because, like, this team has traditionally been so composed and resilient against basically everybody else. But we found like, our kryptonite. Yeah, and it's just, it's silly because... Like, the Oilers are not very good. And, like, realistically, even last year during the playoffs, there was two or three of the games that the Flames lost that they, frankly, should have won had they not gotten in their own way. And I would say even in this one, I didn't think the Oilers looked all that dangerous until the tying goal was scored. Yeah. Oh, no, the Oilers were basically on life support until that flukish goal. And... You know, like if Markstrom had just let the play go and allowed McDavid to get it and take the shot and was actually ready and composed for it instead of, you know, rushing to check his positioning, it, it you know, like that's an easy save for Markstrom. And, you know, the Oilers probably just limp on to lose the game. And I instead- think that Markstrom made the right decision on that one. Um, I don't think we can fault him necessarily for the reaction they had, especially against a top shooter. And I've heard a lot of people say this was marks from the cost of Flames to lose. I don't think that's right either. No. Uh, it, it, goalies will allow a bad goal every once in a while. And it's uh, incumbent on the team to pick the goalie up when that happens or, you know, not play like your hair is on fire. And... Like, the Flames, it was like you were expecting the Oilers to score. Like after well, Even the- Daryl Sutter said afterwards, you had to score at least three to beat this team. Yeah, and it just looked like the Flames were just waiting for something to go in, and then, oh, well, now we can try again. And Well, and the Flames got 42 shots on net, but I would really say that I don't think that Jeff Skinner, the Oilers goalie, really had to make any high-end saves. Like, there was a lot of traffic on the net, but I wouldn't say there was a lot of really dangerous or, you know, high-end shots there. No, and the Flames uh, were not screening the goalie 
Like, there were not a lot of cross-ice passes or secondary saves that Skinner had to make. And that's not to say that, like, he wasn't busy, like, 42 saves. That's quite a lot of uh, shots to face. A lot of rubber. You know, but it's also... Like, the team just seems a little bit out of sorts in terms of generating and uh, not only chances, but finishing those opportunities. I thought the Flames looked really good in the second period, especially five on five. And I would say overall, I think the Flames did a lot of things you want to see them doing in this game. But I think, like you said, there was probably that sort of Edmonton is the boogeyman in the back of their head. And maybe they weren't doing things the way they needed to because there was already this fear or maybe fear is not the best word but maybe this sort of yeah i guess fear is maybe the best word built in the back of their head about the oilers yeah and like realistically if the flames were playing insert any other opponent here like even if they they allowed the other team to tie it up they would have reset themselves calmed down and like had a good fourth line uh shift the after the goal to cycle in their zone and you know start to rebuild the momentum but like it was immediately like off the puck drop that it, the Oilers went on the Harlem Globetrotter mode uh, on the Flames and you know like they're not that good and yet you know the Flames just let them do that for the last three minutes after the McDavid goal until they added another and then you know by then and it was too any- late if anyone's worried about uh, Jonathan Huberdeau, he left partway through the first period, and there's worry he might have been injured. Uh, Daryl Sutter confirmed after the game he wasn't injured. He just had to use the bathroom. Yes. So he's all yeah. good. Yeah. He's five pounds lighter now, but he's uh, he's all good. Yes. <laughs> so don't worry about Huberdeau. Yeah. Well, well, Matt, with that, now the Flames have finished up their October schedule. They've now played seven games. And the best start for the team so far, they are 5-2 uh, and two in seven games, which puts them third in the Pacific Division, behind Edmonton at 12 points and Vegas at 14 points. Right below us is Seattle, also tied for 10 points, but they played more games. They've played 10 games so far. Um, when you look at this first month for the Flames, what are your overall thoughts? Well, frankly, looking at the caliber of opponents that the Flames were playing, the only team that was weaker on paper... Uh, at least at the start of the year, was the Buffalo Sabres and then six high-quality opponents. And for the Flames to be even 500 would have been an adequate month. Um, so the fact that they're 5-2, and two, that's four points more than I was expecting, frankly. Which is something we never see from these guys. Like they usually have a crappy October. Yeah, and, like, frankly, you know, like, the Flames, like, if they had been playing... Some of the mediocre-ish teams, uh, I think that they would have been... Like, you wouldn't be seeing the first line struggling quite as much as they have been. And, like, chemistry would have been a little further ahead. But it's hard when, like, you're facing premier guys on the defensive side and trying to figure out how to actually play with each other during that. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of things they're still trying to figure out there for sure. Um, would you say that the Flames are still chasing their first 60-minute effort of the season? Yeah, I'd have to say so. Uh, like, I think, I think, I think that the come, Flames can... I think they've done 40, but I don't think they've done 60 yet. Yeah, it, it's like the Flames can out-talent other teams and like out-effort other teams, and I think that's part of the reason why like they've been able to beat Colorado, Edmonton, Vegas, Pittsburgh... Carolina. It's a combination between out talent and out work. It's just that uh, they're not reliably getting contributions from the first line. And, you know, like I think the fourth, second, and fourth lines have been overperforming, and the first and third have been virtually non existent. And I think that will come as those lines are learning about new chemistry and that sort of thing. But I also wonder. And we've talked about this in the past with other teams and even other iterations of the Flames. I wonder if they get a little cocky. They've often gone out and played a great first period. And I wonder if they start to get in their heads a little bit that, oh, we don't need to work the full 60 here. And then they, the other team sort of catches them on that. 
Yeah, and I think there's a lot of teams around the league that are guilty of that at times, but it seems more repetitive with the Flames, and especially, like, in the first period of uh, the Edmonton game, like, even though it was a 0-0 tie after one, I thought the Flames were the better of the two teams, didn't really allow Edmonton much, got the shorthanded goal, gave up the power play goal right away, and then got a late goal by Richie, and like the, everything seemed to be going the correct route until that tying goal. And it's it'll be interesting to see like if they can maintain the starts more. And like against the Penguins, they were really good to start, and you know then hit the wall in the second. And it'll be just interesting, like especially as we're going into teams like Seattle, Nashville. New Jersey, New York, Islanders, New Jersey again. Like, a lot of those teams are kind of on the mediocre-ish side um, overall. So, it'll be interesting with... If Calgary can actually start imposing their will more um, and just, like, forcing other teams to be desperate just to um, keep up and... You know, because, like, I remember when, like, teams like Chicago and Boston from years before, like, you would have to work the full 60 minutes to even be able to be close in those games. And, you know, it'll be... I'm looking forward to seeing if Calgary can start to mimic that kind of performance. And on that, that idea of sort of creating an identity and becoming that type of team... So far in this season, the Flames have played seven games. Only one has been on the road, and even that hasn't been much of a road trip. It was just up north to Edmonton. Do you think this extended homestand, which lasts till the end of this coming week, the first week of November, has helped the team or hurt the team? A little bit of both. Um, like They've been able to get adequate practice time, but uh, like the game against Edmonton, if this had been a Thursday night game instead of a Saturday night game where they're like having three days rest... I think that the Oilers lose that game uh, because I think the Flames would have been more fresh and ready. Uh, and, like, they just seem to not be as sharp as they needed to be overall throughout the game. And where the Oilers, like, they had been playing every other day. And so, like, they had more momentum available to them because they were fresh. Yeah, I can see that. And like that's gonna, the, that's one of the things I hate about like the long breaks is like yeah it's good to get the guys rest but it's also that first game back usually it does not turn out too well just because the other team is not usually dealing with that problem. <laughs> and we've heard about teams going on the road and really getting their chemistry and their bonding done because you have nobody else to be with but your teammates and when you're at home you have the pressures of home and life and all those sort of things and. I've wondered if maybe, I mean, yes, they've got a lot of practice, and I think we can see that in their game, but I wonder if maybe a bit of an extended road trip would be good just to get some of the chemistry going. Yeah, and after the few next few games, uh, they're going on a nine, nine games out of 11 stretch where they're on the road, which is also a bizarre pair of road trips where they go out east for like four games they come back to calgary for two and then they go back out east for the rest and it's and we'll we'll preview the november schedule in a little bit but yeah very very weird month here weird season in general i think Mm -hmm. matt as you know the flames have not named a captain so far this year and they have four alternates i'm wondering and this is something i was thinking about today is Nazem Kadri making a case to be the Flames' captain this year? If they were going to name a captain, I'm starting to think, you know what, Kadri, with the way he's playing, the way he's showing up, what he's doing on the ice, I think that if they were to take one of the, let's assume that they're going to make a captain of one of those four alternates. The guy, I don't think you create somebody else your captain. I think he's making a case right now that if there's going to be a guy wearing the C, it should be him. Yeah, I agree. Um, it, It's been pretty cut, cut and dry that like he's been the best forward thus far on the team and perhaps even the best player overall and he's putting it out on the ice and on the bench too when like, i've seen him chatting up the other players to try and get them pumped up too and you know 
It, it, it's nice to see somebody emerging in that role, possibly. And, and I've never been one who believed that your captain had to be your best player. I think sometimes teams get in a, a bad habit of doing that. And I look at, say, the Oilers and McDavid and sort of what I call the blind leading the blind. You know, the young player, the guy who's not a good leader being the captain. But I think, like you said, you see him chatting guys up. You see the way he's talking to the media. Like, I just think that we're, we're seeing Kadri emerging as a leader both on and off the ice already. I agree. And then if you got to give a C to somebody, if you're looking for the best player, does that mean that Brett Ritchie gets a C since he's emerging as an elite sniper in the National Hockey League? Well, uh, you know, you got to credit Milan Lucic for that nice behind the back pass to Ritchie out front. Like, that was a slick pass by Luch. I think you got to do both. I mean, Luch made the great pass, but how many guys on the fourth line would have not made that? Oh, I know. And to his credit, Ritchie is really stepped up his game and I think that he's he recognized after last season's rather average performance by him uh that he needed to be better if he wants to continue having an NHL career beyond this season um so him striking often and early you know that'll bode well for him um for when it comes time to negotiate a new contract, whether with us or otherwise. I totally agree. I'm, I'm kind of being facetious there. I mean, it's great to see him doing that. And you love to see your guys like him and Stone who are on, you know, very cheap contracts doing well. Exactly. Matt, we have a whole bunch of Flames milestones coming up here. And I just thought I'd read through, through these here for Flames fans. Credit to friend of the show, Ryan Pike over at Flames Nation for compiling these. Did you know that game 1,500, or NHL game 1,500, I say, the Saldome, is coming up Thursday against Nashville? Oh, that's really cool. They played 120 in the Corral, and I haven't checked, but based on how old this building is, that's got to be one of the buildings in the league, probably besides like MSG, that's had the most games played in it. Yeah, well, uh, the Saldome's one of the oldest buildings in the league, so it makes a lot of sense that that number is getting quite up there. Should we use the term the NHL likes to use and call it a reverse retro arena? Exactly. Back um, when you didn't have washrooms. That's right. <laughs> and proper concourses. Back when the Olympics was still amateurs. Yes. <laughs> um, Nazem, uh, Jonathan Huberto. Let's go there. Jonathan Huberto's next goal is going to be his 200th career NHL goal. Nazem Kadri's two assists away from 300 in his NHL career. Tyler Toffoli, two points away from 400 in his career and four goals away from 200. Mackenzie Weger, three assists away from 100. Elias Lindholm was four games away from reaching 300 with the Flames. Nikita Zadorov, eight games away from playing 500 in his career. Blake Coleman's 11 games away from 400 in his career. Markstrom is 16 appearances away from 400 in his career. And Daryl Sutter is 19 wins behind Badger Bob Johnson for the all-time Flames franchise lead for head coaches. He's 72 games behind Johnson for the most games coach for a Flames head coach. And he'll tie Atlanta's longtime coach Fred Creighton for second place in 20 more games. So I guess, you know, some interesting stats there. I'm a bit of a stats guy, but also just to show that this is a very veteran team. A lot of guys who have a lot of mileage on them for better or for worse on this roster this year. Yeah, and that's a mark of a team that's getting more into contender style mode uh, where you're plugging the higher quality free agents in in hopes of them meshing with everybody so that way you can take that next step. For sure. I guess we should probably get to one of our fan questions here. Longtime listener Ryan, uh, fr- Ryan Swanson on Twitter at seven six Swanson. He gave us a bit of a long question here, and I'll I'll read it all, and then we can break down his two questions. Who from twenty twenty one twenty two could shut down McD? Who from twenty twenty two twenty three season do you think can shut down McD the best? I had lots of hopes for the last Flames regime. Last summer, I called the change the I called the change the core. In order to get to the finals. We need a team who can shut down McD. This is what the Flames did in the mid to late 80s with 99, and now the Flames need to do it again with 97. So uh, Ryan very focused on the Oilers here. Let's break down the first two questions. Who from 21-22 could shut down McDavid? Audrey and Backlund, frankly. Those will be the well, two Well, Kadri wasn't on the lineup last year. I know. Well, 
Ah, uh, I see. Um, 21 22. I would say, honestly, nobody. And that's yeah. why the Flames ended up going out in the playoffs. True. Um, yeah. And, well, I would actually say Tanev would be the one guy, but, you know, like he was playing basically with one arm last year. And he was actually very effective against McDavid, despite, you know, his shoulder being completely messed up later on in the series. And I would also say to answer this question a little bit further, I think if you're relying on one guy to shut down McDavid, you've already got issues. Like I think shutting down a player like McDavid, or he later on in this question mentions uh, Wayne Gretzky, I think it has to be a team effort. And I think if you're looking for one or two guys to be in that role, you've already lost that game. Yeah, well, you look at uh, like when the Flames were playing Colorado in the season opener, uh, Any time that McKinnon or McCarr got the puck, like the Flames would be communicating each, with each other, like tighten up, tighten up, because those guys were on the ice and they had the puck and they can burn you. And like the Flames, uh, it, you know, like hearkening back to the Markstrom uh, thing with the second goal for the Oilers in the last game, you know, like that's it, where you have to be situationally aware that, you know, like if that puck does not get stopped by you that it is going to McDavid and McDavid is smart enough and good enough where he can place that puck if you're not set. And, you know, like that's why I was more criticizing Markstrom on that play, just because of the lack of situational awareness that it was him that was going to get the puck. And, you know, like if it had been any of the other Oilers players, it wouldn't have been as big a deal with that puck squeaking by because you're not going to get the same caliber of shot from say Derek Ryan as you're going to get from McDavid. And it's just uh, unfortunate that the team seemed to be doing so well with that at the start of the year and have regressed a little bit. Um, but, but you know what? Nobody plays 82 really good games. No. And how would you say it's, just gives Daryl more things to talk about in practice to, you know, like smarten up, make sure that you're doing this all the time. And, you know, it's hard to be consistent all the time. You're going to give up goals that are unfortunate or just play poorly from period to period of game to game. Um, at times, and you need to be able to figure out how to turn the boat around uh, when it's coming against you. I forget which Flames coach it was. It sounds like a comment Daryl would make, but I don't think it was Daryl. Maybe it was Gullitson or Ward, but one of them after the Flames went on a long win streak and then got a loss actually said, you know, I'm kind of glad we got a loss because when you're winning all your games, the team doesn't really want to listen and do things differently in practice. No, and it makes sense because, you know, if you're having all the bounces go your way, you can cheat a little bit and still get away with it. But it's when those bounces stop working that things can quickly get out of hand. And As I just said that, I'm thinking it's terrible that we've had so many coaches. I can't remember who said what. Yeah. It's like, uh, so which really bad coach are we talking about? So many generic uh, coaches that we don't know who said what when. Yeah. Um, so going on with Ryan's comment here, who from the 2022-2023 Flames do you think can shut down McDavid the best? You said Kadri earlier. Yeah, well, Kadri is one of the fastest players in the NHL, so just from a logistics standpoint, it makes sense that he'd be the best at keeping up with McDavid. Um, and he did an effective job in both games. Um, not quite as good as he could have been, but was solid in both games defensively against McDavid's line. I think Kadri, I think a name you said earlier of Tanev, but I really think all six of the defensemen need to, if we're really going to shut him down, need to be in that position. Oh, yeah, because you're not going to necessarily have um, home ice advantage throughout each game, and you're going no, to No, and need... you're not going to be able to put one player out against McDavid the whole time he's on the ice. Yeah, so it's got to be a group effort, and yesterday but was... But if I put names... Yeah, yesterday was just not quite good enough. If I have to put names out there, which is, I think, what Ryan's looking for, I would say Kadri on the forward side, and let's say Tan Evan Weger on the back end. I agree. And those are the guys. And then another thing here about uh, what Ryan had mentioned, 
In order to get to the finals, we need a team that can shut down McDavid. Do you think that's true? Uh, how would you say the Oilers are a team that, like, McDavid and Dreisaitl are going to score on you. Uh, just in general, because they're going to get power plays, and that is their bread and butter. If you can manage to stop the Oilers from getting tons of power plays and limit the opportunities for them, uh, like five on five, the Flames will destroy the Edmonton Oilers. It's the special teams that tends to be the problem with this team. And, um, like, yeah, they should be able to beat them in a series, but, you know, they also have to not treat them as the boogeyman. Yeah, I agree with that. And I don't know I would say that's the key to the Flames going to the Cup. I think that there are bigger challenges if they go that deep than McDavid. Definitely they need to get through McDavid to get to, you know, the Western Conference Finals or past that. But I, I, I don't think that will be their opponent in the Western Conference Finals. Um, but I, I understand what he's saying. And I think you've got to definitely find a way to solve McDavid if you're going to go far because Edmonton is going to be a team that's standing in your way. Yeah, because realistically, at the end of the season, the standings are going to be 1-2-3 with Vegas, Edmonton, and us in some permutation. And unless we face them in the first round, like you're, the Flames are likely going to win the division just based on quality of each team. Um, so, you know, if the Oilers get through Vegas, assuming that's how that breaks down, you know, like you're gonna have to find a way to beat a team that was capable of beating Vegas, and you know, like that's not an easy opponent. And uh, you know, Calgary has to be able to beat their first round opponent, and you know, then look at the conference finals, and they'll probably play Dallas or Colorado, just assuming, you know, and like both of those teams are really good. So, you know, it none of the teams that the Flames are going to play uh, when it gets time for that are going to be easy opponents and they have to learn how to cope with different types of star players not just you know like McDavid alone and you know because like if the Flames play Colorado like you're gonna have to deal with McCarr and McKinnon for seven games or if you're playing Dallas you gotta face Ottinger again and, like, what kitchen sink can you throw at them this time? <laughs> you know, and... Well, I think too often you see teams that focus on one guy and then they effectively contain that guy, but then they leave a lot of other guys open. Yeah. So I, I'd hate for the Flames to shut down McDavid because I think that Edmonton, to their credit, is deeper than just McDavid. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't want them to shut down McDavid and then somebody else, you know, goes out and scores. So I think really maybe the better way to look at this is and we talked about this earlier, Matt. The Flames need to get out of their head. They need to stop looking at Edmonton like their arch rival or like the Bowser, their Mario, and need to just figure out a way to beat this team and treat them like any other team. Yeah, and you know, like you look at um, like last game, uh, the frankly the two most dangerous players that I thought on the ice for the Oilers uh, were Ryan Nugent Hopkins and Zach Hyman. And, you know, like, neither of those guys are McDavid or Dreisaitl. And the Flames, I thought, did rather well, for the most part, at containing those two. But, you know, left the other guys open far too often because, oh, you're not one of the two big monsters. And, you know, it burned them for a couple goals. Exactly, yeah. So I think it's, it's dangerous as a coach. Or somebody trying to coach a team to say, you know, go after this guy and, you know, cover just this guy. And I think we see that time and time again with different teams where it's just, you know what, it's not going to work. And you've got to, I think you have to approach every team as a holistic piece. And yes, that's definitely an important thing to be able to stop McDavid. But I think you've got to be able to stop. I mean, Hyman really, I think, was the problem last night. Yeah. So how do you stop Hyman? How do you stop some of the other guys on the other team as well? Yeah. And it's kind of like a, in general, stop McDavid and Dreisaitl uh, to the best of your abilities, but then also recognize, oh, so-and-so is doing really good tonight, 
and we have to step up our efforts on him specifically as well just to keep you know everything a little bit further down and you know like the Oilers do have six or seven different players that can score it's just that um you know some are vastly more likely than others but you have to be able to respect the secondary guys as well and you know the flames seem to be able to do either or they focus really well at getting the secondary guys which allows mcdavid to run roughshod over them or they focus too much on mcdavid and everybody else plays well so it it'll it'll be interesting to see if they can find the balance between the two they just haven't and i think a lot of it's just getting in their own way and you know because edmonton is not that good like they're good they can outscore teams but like just the overall composition of the team they're not very good and it it's like you kind of, the t- flames seem to be distracted a little bit by the shiny toys so to speak instead of t- just doing their thing and, you know, I still believe that if you have a team that has the right roster makeup and you're playing the right way, you don't need to worry about covering one or two players. That will come just by playing the right hockey for 60 minutes. I agree. And you I know. think that part of the problem is, is just frankly that this team is still figuring out, especially on the forward side, uh, how to play with each other. And, like, the defense pretty much has locked things down really effectively and have played exceptionally well for most of the games this season, um, with the only exception being when Connor Mackey drew in and distracted everything because uh, Hannafin was out. Uh, but other than that one game, like, the defense has played rather effectively and has really made it hard for the other teams to get going and that's very important for this team it's just now hopefully over the next month we start to see the forward group figure things out a little better so that way we're not uh having the second and fourth line carry the team alone it'll come but at the same time i think it says something about the team that you know, the second and fourth line are able to carry the team the way they are, and that even with the first line having struggles, which every line is going to struggle at some point, that, you know what, we're still able to get those wins. Yeah, and, like, you look at the through the seven games, like, the first line has not scored a five-on-five goal yet, which that's very important for this team, for them to be, you know, like, it's great that they're doing great on the power play, and, you know, Calgary has a very dangerous power play because of everybody it's just trying to figure out how to make the first line work without stealing guys from the second line to make it work. Uh, like whether you move Kadri up and move Lindholm down, or say Manjapani and Kadri up and Tafoli and Lindholm down. You know, trying to get everybody to just click so that way um, things are a lot more dynamic and spread out instead of concentrated. I think that's, you know, something that we could debate for a while, but we're not going to have any answers. I think we just need to see how that plays out over the next two or three weeks. Yeah, and frankly, I think that the Flames playing the lesser teams over the next stretch of games will help them uh, just because you're more likely to get a good bounce and uh, maybe a garbage goal or two against, like, the Seattles and the Nashvilles, uh, where, like, the first line... Uh, like, if they can get, like, if Lindholm actually gets one uh, in the next couple days, like, he had a lengthy stretch last year where he didn't score two, and then he went on a tear, and I think that uh, he... I don't w- think Lindholm has to be a big scorer. I think he's got to be a big points guy, but I don't think they have to be goals. Yeah, it just looks like he's trying too hard to basically replicate the... Uh, Gaudreau Kachuk line, and it's just that the, like Toffoli and Huberdo are not those guys, and Toffoli has played well, and Huberdo mostly has played well. It's just Lindholm has to kind of get out of his own way to allow uh, the team to gel a little bit more, and I think he's just trying too hard to make things work, and instead of just having things come by instinct like he normally does 
Well, you had mentioned the Flames playing some lesser teams here. Why don't we look ahead to the Flames' schedule for November? Uh, they just finished off their seven-game September, and they've got, or sorry, October, and they have three more home games in a row. They play Seattle on the first, Nashville on the third, and New Jersey on the fifth, and that really ends this. I'll call it a long home streak. I don't think the Edmonton game really counts as much of a road trip. And then they're on the road for nine of their next 12 games, going on the road to the Islanders, the Devils, and the Bruins. They're back here for Winnipeg and L.A., and then they're back on the road for Tampa Bay, Florida, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Washington, Carolina, and then back at the end of the month for Florida. So quite a bit of time on the road and quite a bit of time in the East here. And I have mixed feelings about a long Eastern trip. I mean... If this team needs to gel and if they need to get some losses, which I think they might in order to get that gelling, I'd rather drop those points this month of November against those teams in the East than, you know, the beginning of the month and in October against the West. But at the same time, as you mentioned, some not as good teams here. And I think that might be your chance as a team to, I don't want to say run rough shop, but maybe start to figure out who you are and and what you can do and what your strengths are against some of those teams. Yeah, and especially like in the middle to later of the month when you're playing the Bostons, the Tampas, the Floridas, the Pittsburghs, and the Washingtons, uh, you know, like those are all games that you have to get up for because of the fact that like those teams are dynamite, and where the the teams like uh, Philadelphia, uh, Montreal at the start of next month, uh, Winnipeg, LA, like those guys, they're decent, but they're not all that and then some either and Calgary needs to just learn how to have consistency overall and not fall to the good teams and falter to the good teams while being composed against some of the softer opponents. Another interesting thing and we talked about earlier this season is that Daryl Sutter said he wanted to play Dan Vladar once a week. Well, we're now three weeks in the season, and Villar started once, which by that, I mean, I don't think Daryl necessarily meant once a week. I'm thinking he kind of means 26 starts during the year, which is roughly once a week. But I think I can see a game in each one of the weeks in November where I can see Vladar starting. Yeah, like I'm assuming that uh, the Seattle game, for example, will be a Dan Vladar start. Yeah, I could even see if they want to put Markstrom in there, I could see the New Jersey game then being the Vladar start. Yeah. Or Nashville. The next week, yeah, the, ne- the next week I could see it being the Islanders game or even the Winnipeg game. Yeah. Um, the week after that, I don't know, L.A. or Florida. You probably don't start them against Tampa. Well, being an afternoon game, I would assume against the Panthers just because yeah. why mess with the Markstrom's routine? Just have Ladar start that one. and The only weird thing about the Panthers is the next week I would start them against Philadelphia, and I don't know you want to put them in twice in a row. Well, yeah, it's a little tough because, like, the Flames play three afternoon games this month uh, against the Panthers on the 19th, the 25th, and 26th. And and two back-to-backs, which is weird. Like, when do we ever get two back-to-back afternoon games? Yeah, very bizarre scheduling for, like, you usually only get two or three afternoon games in a season. And we're kind of expending our quota in one month. Yeah. And not only that, but because it is an Eastern series, we should let fans know pretty much every game is early. Like, all the Eastern games are either 5 p.m. or earlier starts. Yeah, which is good. Um, At least, you know, the games will be over and you can still have time to go out for dinner. So, (laughs) Yeah, as long as you're home from work on time. True. Um, One more thing here. Uh, Anything else you want to talk about with the November schedule? Uh, no, uh, I think that the Flames, basically like looking at their schedule more broadly, pretty much until New Year's, most of the teams they're playing are good, just generally, with the odd stinker team thrown in the mix. And uh, basically, Calgary just needs to survive while playing effectively through pretty much Christmas, New Year, <clears throat> New Year's in order to um set themselves up for a strong finish in the second half of the season where like they're playing a lot lesser opponents especially down the stretch like all of april i think they play seven games and they're all against mediocre teams so you know when i look at the when i look at the um the schedule here 
it's interesting because this to me feels like the first real season of the NHL season for the Flames. Like their October schedule was easy, but we've got our first back to backs, our first road trip. We've actually got two back to backs, and they're pretty much playing every other day all all month. So it really to me feels like this is where we're gonna see what the grind of the NHL season does to this team. Yeah. I agree. And it'll be interesting to see if they do respond. A lot of teams look good when they have extended home stands, so we'll really see what this team looks like when we send them on the road. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, it all being in pretty much the same time zone will help the team significantly when they're on the road. Because that's a good point too. I didn't think of that. Yeah, because they pretty much got you know a whole road trip in the let's call it the tri-state area: New York, New Jersey, Boston. So that's one time zone. Tampa Bay, Florida is a kind of another two game trip and that's its own time zone. Philadelphia and Pittsburgh were back to New York and then Washington, Carolina, I think is the same time zone as New yeah, York. All of them are. Okay. Yeah. They're literally all in the Eastern time zone. So yeah, there you go. So nice and easy. Yep. Makes life then a lot the, less simple or a lot more simple <laughs> for sure. Um, well, let's uh, let's then chat about one piece of news that came out today. We're recording this on the 30th. The Calgary Flames assigned uh, Luke Siona to a three-year entry-level deal. He was their 2021 sixth-round pick uh, from Edmonton. We won't fault him for that. He's been playing with the Seattle Thunderbirds, the WHL, and off to a really good start. He's got 17 points, seven goals, and 10 assists in the first nine games for that team. Yeah, and the main knock on him as a prospect and why he fell to the sixth round was his lack of foot speed. Uh, But he's been working on that, and it's improved significantly. And, like, you're seeing the results where he has, like, 17 points in nine games, uh, one of the league leaders in points, and just looking like a very dynamic player. And, like, the skill set was always there. It was the foot speed that was holding him back. So if he's addressed that enough, he might become a top-tier prospect for the Flames. Uh, and it'll be one of the things to watch, especially for prospect fans, um, and see if he can be, the, like, the next Andrew Mangiapane, uh sixth-round pick guy that turns into a quality NHLer. And if not... I mean, now that we've got the Wranglers in town, even if he becomes a quality AHL, our fans can still get to see him. True. Well, let's uh, let's talk about this week that's coming up. Last week we did our predictions, and I'm up two nothing this season. I unfortunately predicted we'd lose to Edmonton, win to Pittsburgh. You thought we'd win both of them, so I won uh, the week. Yeah, frankly, I was expecting the same just because of the break that was in between the two games. Um, but I was, you know, I I will never pick that the Oilers are going to beat the Flames. So, no. (laughs) Do we, I'm just looking here, talking about breaks. Do we get a one week bye? Oh, we do get a bye week this year, but it's not till the beginning of February, it looks like. Yeah. Um, so we've got three games in the table this coming week, all home games again. On Tuesday, the Calgary Flames host the Seattle Kraken. Then Thursday for the 1,500th NHL game in the Saddle Dome, the Nashville Predators come to town, both those 7 p.m. start times. And then Saturday, the Calgary Flames will have a Hockey Night in Canada game taking on the New Jersey Devils for an 8 p.m. start time. Matt, what are you thinking here? Win-win-loss. Interesting. Okay, why do you think that? Uh, Seattle is better, but the Flames are still significantly better than Seattle. Um, UC Soros is doing really well for Nashville, but as, on the whole, Nashville's kind of in that quasi rebuilding, not rebuilding limbo that like the flames were in back in like 2010, where they're just kind of stuck in the middle. And like, I don't think they're going to be a playoff team this year, but I don't think they're going to be dreadful either, and they're just kind of stuck. And I think the Flames, the, all the games against Nashville seem to be fun and exciting, but I think the Flames will come out on top on that one. And New Jersey's been really impressive. They just kicked Columbus's butt today, 7-1, to one, and they're currently leading their division. And um, it, they look like they've finally turned the corner, so... Uh, it'll be interesting to see how they match up against them. Uh, New Jersey is a very young team generally, so 
Uh, and we saw how the Flames kind of struggled with the Buffalo Sabres, who have very much that same youthful vigor to them. So uh, that one will be the most interesting game of the week to see how they can respond to a team that's mostly similar to Buffalo from earlier this year. That's interesting around the Buffalo. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, I'm going to go two games for wins, but I think they're going to be different. I think they'll beat Seattle, and I think they'll beat New Jersey. But like you said, we always get exciting games against Nashville, and I think that the Nashville Predators might end up besting the Flames in that one. Yeah. So I think we're both expecting four of the six points, just a matter of how we get there. Yep. Well, Matt, any other Flames topics you think we need to cover for the week? Uh, uh, not really. Um, I think Sutter said it well about Huberdeau, so. <laughs> and, yeah. It is yeah, what it is. I, we'll just leave it there. We won't use the word that Daryl Sutter used, but if anybody wants to go hear how he described uh, um, Huberdeau uh, having to use the bathroom, you can go listen to the, the media release. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, and, and it was just, I don't know, it would totally came out of left field. I just thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Oh, I know. It was the blunt frankness of it that... Okay. And I don't want to talk about guys' bathroom schedules on the show, but I also wondered to myself, it was like 10 minutes into the first, why didn't you use the bathroom before you went out there? Yeah. I, I don't I know. I could see it like, you know, in the third or something, but like, you, you're you 10 minutes into the game. Did you arrive at the arena late or what happened? Yeah. A little odd, but yeah, it's each their own. It happens. At least it wasn't in a playoff game like Luongo that one time. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Well, Matt, uh, why don't you uh, let us know what everyone's going to be saying for these three games of the Dome. As always, go Flames, go. And the Oilers still suck. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.